Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That's So Po, and today I'm here with my husband, Sush, mm -hmm. and we're going to be discussing the 2019 Hugo finalists for the Novelette category. Uh, we are going to Worldcon this summer, which we're very excited about. If you're going to, please let us know down in the comments or connect with me on Goodreads. Um, and we are trying to vote in the short story, novelette, novella, and novel categories. Um, so we're trying to read through all of those. We did a video on the short stories, a discussion of that, which I will link below. And today we're doing the novelettes. We're going to do our best to avoid spoilers, um, but we're not particularly great at that. So um, just warning you that there may be a little bit more information in here than uh, is purely spoiler free. However, I will link below all of the different six um, novelettes that are eligible for this award. Um, most of them are available for free online and I have those links. There's only one of them which isn't, uh, but that is available in the Hugo Voters Packet if you are going to Worldcon and have that packet as well. One thing I will add to that is in our short story collection we weren't that good about the spoilers, so if you follow that link be aware. <laughs> um, but today we will try to do better. Yeah, we're gonna try at least. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is because I give ratings to stories and Sush doesn't, we're going to go by my rating. And that's not necessarily to say that we're always 100% in agreement. Um, so as we go through them, we'll talk about what we feel, but the rating that you see will be my rating, not Sush's rating. Mm -hmm. And we kind of tried to structure it a little bit, talking about you know the, the summary of the story, um, themes that we saw in it and our impressions of it. And, so uh, our first story is a story uh, called If at First You Don't Succeed, Try, Try Again by Zen Cho. Um, this is a story about a Korean mythical uh, creature, a serpent-like creature that can evolve into a dragon. Um, it spends a thousand years in meditating under the seas uh, and kind of like uh, preparing itself to make a giant leap into the heavens to ascend and uh, and then be and become a dragon and so as it's doing this humanity is kind of you know getting out of the caves and then building out first parts of civilization and things like that and basically uh you know it waits out a thousand years and then it tries to leap to the heavens and then things go wrong and then it tries to prepare again and go again and uh the the kind of uh background to this is the kind of creature that it is where it is uh, very much shaped by how others perceive it. And so basically its uh, chance of success is very much affected by that. And so basically then it's, it, it tries various things. It's like, what if I were lonely and no one noticed me? What if I were to create a persona for myself? And you know, it tries various kinds of things. And then the story kind of just goes from there. And uh, somewhere along the way, uh, there's this notion of uh, comparing your, your goals. Are you living your life for your goal? Or are you living your life for your life and you ignore the goal? Mm -hmm. And uh, if so, does that mean you have stopped living if you, know, you no longer have that goal? So it, there, there are these kinds of themes that are explored in it and uh, themes of connectedness with other uh, you know, uh, people around you, uh, themes of what it means to live and things like that. So very much what is the meaning of your life? <laughs> mm -hmm. And if this big goal is something that you cannot achieve, is your life meaningless or mm -hmm. are you able to find meaning in other ways? Mm -hmm. And also very much about how things like, uh, you know, how much uh, sh do you let other people shape you? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh, and that theme of ego is, I think, explored. Um, so, uh, and then it also talks about fulfillment in a sense. Mm -hmm. It's like what yeah. fulfills you. Yeah, very definitely. So uh, the theme was actually, I thought, really neat. The uh, mythology was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the writing also is pretty charming at various spots. Um, and it was charming, but um, it was very cutesy, and sometimes it got just a little too cutesy for me. So, uh, humor is always one of those things where I really love humorous writing, but if it goes a little too far, that can be a little off-putting for me. And so sometimes this went just a little further than I liked. And in terms of impression, I have to say I really like the premise. I like the world, the mythos, um, but 
the story itself and even the characters apart from the primary mm -hmm. character fell a little short of uh, you know doing the premise justice yeah, it felt just a little um, shallow. Like it didn't necessarily draw us in deeply. Mm -hmm. It was it was an it was an interesting read, but it didn't kind of really satisfy. It didn't fulfill that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it felt it it felt like it had a very cool premise, great mythology, interesting kind of world, and uh, also interesting themes. But at the same time, it just felt a little fluffy, and we weren't necessarily thoroughly um, engaged in the story at all time. So. It was enjoyable, but you know, kind of maybe a little forgettable. Uh, so I gave it 3.5 out of five stars. And uh, I just realized as you were going this, that you can go meta into this and the, the story itself can be the dragon. And then it's affected <laughs> by how we perceive it. Oh, how funny. <laughs> the next novelette that we read is The Thing About Ghost Stories by Naomi Kritzer. And this is an interesting story. It's told from a first person perspective of a folklorist, a woman who is exploring ghost stories as told by various people and trying to analyze what these stories have in common, what they show about the human experience, what the point of ghost stories is. And at the same time that she's presenting this information and talking about her research and her experience interviewing different people and presenting little snippets of ghost stories, she interleaves her own experiences, and in particular, the experience of losing her mother to Alzheimer's. Um, and this is a very interesting way of interleaving the stories and talking about ghosts as well as about losing a loved one and especially the double death of Alzheimer's where somebody is lost mentally before they're lost physically. So this story I thought had a lot of interesting themes, sort of about what is the point of, of death in a sense? What is the point of remembering those who have gone, of having a ghost story? What is the point of telling a ghost story as well as the point of hearing a ghost story? Like what is the purpose? What role does that play in our lives? And how do we view and value um, people who are dead and what they have left behind. So I felt there were a lot of interesting themes in this. Um, I enjoyed the writing. I especially enjoyed that perspective of someone who is losing a loved one to Alzheimer's. I thought that was an interesting voice to hear. Um, but it was maybe not like super, super gripping. It was really enjoyable. I liked the writing. I liked the themes. But um, I didn't necessarily like deeply connect with the character. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's also a lot of, uh, for me, I, I thought I saw fourth wall breaking. <laughs> uh, there's this notion of show, don't tell, right? And this story I thought did a whole, uh, uh, the story told us what it was going to show and then showed that. Yeah. There's, it, the, the thing about ghost stories is that often ghost stories are not stories. They don't have a beginning, middle, and end, and they just kind of um, t tell you what's going on rather than building a full story. And so that kind of meta-ness, I think, yeah. is probably there. And I think the mom is kind of a figurative and a ghost kind of a mm -hmm. figure. In, yes. in, yeah. Yeah, the, the mother who she was is to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So overall, it was enjoyable, um, and I really did like the themes and the writing, but it wasn't spectacular. So I gave it four out of five stars. The next story is called The Last Banquet of Temporal Confections by Tina Connolly. And the story follows the events of an evening of a banquet being hosted by a duke. The primary viewpoint character is this woman called Saffron, who is the chief uh, food taster, uh, actually I should say pastry taster for the Duke. And the reason she's the pastry taster is because her husband is the chief uh, head pastry chef uh, for the Duke. And the Duke has kind of uh, seized power and is commonly called the Tyrant King and he's an all-around baddie. And so basically uh, in, in the story is set in a medievalish uh, setting and uh, basically it's this it's a, it's it's kind of a it takes a fine dining experience like view of the evening 
of the various courses being served and kind of trying to introduce each course. It's like, ah, this course has notes of rosemary and this and that and whatnot. And so basically it tries to talk about uh, the various tastes and what is being presented for each course. So the twist in the story uh, is an interesting one. And I think the premise is really neat. And that is this, there is magic in this world. And uh, these confections, as the title says, are temporal confections. And it has the ability to kind of, uh, you know, recall a memory, uh, to create nostalgia, so to speak, and take you back to a time in your life when you experienced something. And in just the same way as there are different tastes, uh, it's like you might really savor a kind of bitter or really enjoy a lemon and sweet kind of overlay and that sort of a thing. Um, you have different kinds of emotions uh, tagged to each of these memories. And these sweets are kind of, um, you know, kind of designed to kind of evoke uh, a, a time in your memory where you had such similar interleavings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was um, really fascinating. The premise is really fascinating, but also just the experience of reading this, the beauty of the description of all of the foods, it was really quite lovely. Um, mm -hmm. And this idea of being drawn back into your past, into your memories, and it's very much like having a waking dream. Mm -hmm. So it's not just kind of feeling the memory, it's reliving that experience. Mm -hmm. And this idea of the connection between food and memory. It was a very cool premise. Yeah. And as the story progresses, as each course is served, uh, and each course is recalling a different kind of memory, uh, mm -hmm. that is used to build the plot and the backstory for the events that lead up to this day. Yeah. And so I think the premise was excellent. The mm -hmm. writing I thought was really good. Yeah, it really drew me in. I think that the writing was, was beautiful and I felt completely engaged as I was reading this. And uh, if I were to criticize one thing about the story where it didn't work for me, I think it was, again, I think a little simplistic. It was predictable. And I guess it satisfied that, you know, uh, that kind of uh, what it promised to set out to tell. Yeah, but I agree. For me, the, the biggest attraction of this was that it was um, so predictable. The premise was so neat and the writing was neat, but the plot was kind of cookie cutter. So, um, <laughs> right? So it, it, it just, I could tell from the first paragraph how the story was going to play out. I knew what the storyline was going to be, what the plot was going to be. I knew who the characters were going to be. So it felt like the premise and the writing were fascinating and unique and interesting, but the story and the characters were all tales that have been told before. And so that just didn't kind of make the plot line as interesting, even though each individual um, paragraph that you were reading was pretty fascinating. I think the story structure and the way to fill in the backstory yeah. was really cool. Yeah. The premise itself was really cool. Yeah. And But what it was filled in was, was not as satisfying as the yeah. others. Yeah, exactly. It just wasn't quite as satisfying. So overall, I gave this four out of five stars, and I'd definitely be interested in reading something else by this author. Yeah. The next novelette that we read is When We Were Starless by Simone Heller. And this is an interesting sci-fi sort of dystopian future type of world. And we don't really know what the world is. We know that it is probably not Earth. It is somewhere in space, somewhere in time in the future. But it is a world where a, a very advanced civilization, a very advanced technological society has collapsed. And now there are only remnants, kind of broken leftovers many, many years later that are left. And on this planet, there are some sort of um, sapient beings that are maybe dinosaur-like or bird-like. They've got tails and, and feathers and things like that. And they live in tribes. And they're nomadic, kind of roaming the world, trying to survive because this world is very harsh. It's got um, giant centipedes which you know spew acid and attack and kill people. It's got 
dangerous winds which can bring death. It's got just so much danger and very few resources. Um, so mainly the tribe goes and scavenges these uh, resources from old remnants of the previous technological society. And one point they come to an old remnant of, of the technology which has an AI in it and the tribe has to kind of make some decisions about if they're going to follow the traditions that they have, which are very mistrustful of anything like AIs, anything new, um, and they just focus on survival and the folklore and what is known for survival, or if they're going to kind of interact with the AI and learn from it and potentially learn new skills and develop um, their curiosity and their ability, and perhaps create a better life for themselves in this very harsh world. So they have this big pull between safety and curiosity that you see. There's a lot of interesting themes covered in this story, a lot of ideas of you know tradition versus innovation, issues of AI personhood, issues of conformity to your tribe and to your culture and your traditions um, versus you know, somebody who wants to try something new and um, explore on their own or be more individual. Do you break those rules or do you follow them? And what is the cost to your community if you make the wrong decision? And I think there's, uh, there's many stories that are told with the notion of an unreliable narrator. Uh, this story is told from a perspective of an unknown narrator. Mm -hmm. So you are piecing together what is going on based on what the narrator is telling you and you have to figure out, it's like, if a creature that is similar to the creature that just told you this said this, what would it mean? Yeah, and it's it's very much like listening to someone describe something that they've never seen before but you know what it is mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to figure out what is it that they're describing? And so especially because this tribe of, of beings is describing a lot of things that are from this collapsed society, they, for example, describe the AI as a ghost. And so, you know, you're trying to piece together what is it that they're talking about and what does that relate to in tech, terms of technology that we understand. So it's a very curious way yeah. of building your world. Yeah. And uh, it is such a ruthless world and a ruthless society. And I think one of the parts that I found interesting is to be kind of that survival oriented, mm -hmm. uh, you need to be able to uh, basically um, move on and ignore individual person's needs. Mm -hmm. But in that kind of society, you can't really have specialized professions that you absolutely need to have in order to survive either. And they kind of have that as well. So it's interesting to see what and how they actually manage with that sort of a thing. I think that if this were to be made into a much larger novel, mm -hmm. uh, I think it could have been fleshed out a lot more and I would have enjoyed it a lot more. As it is, I did enjoy it, but uh, I, I definitely want more. Yeah, I think that what we found was the story <laughs> was fascinating and the world building was so amazing for what it presented us with, but it presented us with a very brief glimpse into what this world was. And it was rather confusing for a lot of um, reading the story. Like we, we saw these glimpses of really cool world, but we couldn't quite understand what was going on. And if there had been a novel, perhaps that could have been fleshed out more and it could have really um, explained a lot of the backstory and made that world full and real to us. So I gave this four out of five stars, and again, I would be happy to read something else by this author. Our next story is called The Only Harmless Great Thing by Brooke Bolander, and uh, this is a very interesting novel. Um, basically, um, rather than describing a summary of it, which is difficult to do, uh, I think it might be better to do a, a quick description of themes that are covered in this book. Um, there's actually multiple stories going on in this book there's, uh, which are interleaved um, and basically um, I guess the first thing you can say about this book is that it introduces the notion of elephants as a sentient race in our contemporary world. It's sort of an alternate history type yes, of book. Yes, exactly. 
And so it's like if elephants had been sentient and were in our world. What yeah, sentient, but still not treated as like, you know, equal to humans. Separate but equal. <laughs> um, not equal. <laughs> no, not equal. I'm not trying to be. Um, but the idea is, uh, I think the voice and the characters of the elephants are really, really well done. Uh, and I think trying to come up with the notion of uh, elephanthood, as a, uh, and as especially the sisterhood of elephants, is actually very well done in this book. Um, and the voice of the elephants, I yes. think, was particularly moving and engaging. It was very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and another theme that is explored in this is basically the power of stories. Okay, the power of stories to shape, uh, you know, humanity or elephanthood or whatever kind of a thing. Um, and basically, uh, the elephants also have their own stories, and they, which basically shape them in terms of memories that are passed down from generation to generation. And so that I thought was really interesting. Um, and in terms of the, the, this book itself, there's a, a couple of big storylines that are happening, which are, uh, you know, like... Uh, ages apart in a sense, where the second big story is happening in a world where the first big story has happened and supposedly has had a monumental impact on human psyche in a sense. Um, but then I think the book also tries to explore, it's like we say it has had a monumental impact, but has it sort of a thing. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, and this is a world where uh, humanity's harnessing of the atom has not gone well. And we very much are in a strong dystopia of sorts, where we're trying to figure out, it's like, okay, we've screwed up everything. And what do we leave in terms of messages and stories to generations that will finally recover from the issues that we have created? Or at least, uh, if not recover, just like, let's warn them of how badly we messed everything up. Yeah. And so, so there's, a, there's exploration of that. Uh, there's a lot about a uh, notion of what it means to be free, uh, what it means to have choices, and what cost you can pay to create a choice just so that you can have a taste of that freedom, and, and, and things like that. And, uh, and so I think that it goes through quite a few really, really powerful themes and questions. Uh, and one more important thing that I'll mention here is uh, the book uh, goes over some somewhat outrageous -ish events and what's uh, what's interesting is these outrageous events are based on real events they're not really that far off from reality um, one of the main storylines there's basically three main storylines that thread through this so one of the main storylines is um, about sort of radium girls so if you've heard of that book it's basically the women around World War II who worked in watch factories and they would paint on the numbers on the dial of watches using radium um, and they were not told that this was extremely radioactive and you know they got a lot of like um, mouth and throat cancers and were very very Yeah this affected. is because they had these paint brushes that they were told to basically sharpen with their mouth yeah. uh, so that it would have that tip and this is what they've been doing with radium laced just paint. Have, just have a little bit of radium in your mouth yep. multiple times a day it's great yeah, it's totally fine yeah it'll be fine so this this book really also explores that exploitation mm -hmm. and um the almost just brutality of people in power who are abusing those who are um less able to defend themselves or to know what is being done to them and so that kind of abuse of, of people is a big theme and overall i really enjoyed this book. Uh, I will say that uh, around 10-20% I was tempted to DNF it because it was really difficult to read in the beginning. But then, uh, and then finally when the, each of the individual stories that are being threaded kind of catch on, it was very compelling. Um, and I w this is another book that I think uh, is something uh, that would have been served better as a novel and exploring this a lot more. There were a lot of themes packed into, two, uh, into a really tight space. I think it worked, but at the same time, I think it, 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 more of an exploration would have been really good mm -hmm. on this. Yeah, and I think for me, the story was very powerful and I just loved all of the themes that were explored. I mean, just uh, also the, the, the theme of sisterhood 
that Sush mentioned before was so strong. Um, and I really was moved by a lot of this story and I thought the world building was very curious, very interesting. Um, for me, the part that detracted a little bit was that sometimes the author would go just a little bit far for me in terms of the characterization of people or the just kind of, it was just a little extreme sometimes. So for example, there is an uneducated woman who's written a letter and the writing in that is like using misspellings and things like that and sometimes it just felt a little excessive more more so than would be natural for someone who was you know elementary school educated or things like the um the the grossness of some of what was going on with the radium poisoning or um just things happening sometimes that was just a little too much uh, and i think i had this criticism as well with brooke bolander's short story mm -hmm. um that was the raptor princess one that we talked about last time where it just went a little too far sometimes it was a little over the top uh, and so that just again it kind of brings me out of the story briefly even so, I think this was a really, really strong story, and I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars. And I think for me, of all the novelists that I read, this was my favorite. And the last novelette that we're going to talk about is Nine Last Days on Planet Earth by Daryl Gregory. And I will note it that this is my highest rated novelette, but this is actually Sush's lowest rated novelette. So we were completely divided on this one. I did want to mention that before going into it just because um, even though it's kind of at the top of the list, it's only because we're going by my ratings. So get your own channel. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so this story is a very slow story and um, it's a little bit of a saga. So it follows a boy um, through his life. So from when he is a young teenager all the way through when he's a very old man. And we get little snippets from his life at different periods. And the story definitely follows his own personal life. So um, he's gay and he's dealing with kind of coming out and his parents, he's got a very um, traditional type of father and he is also trying to find his way. He comes from a small town and he wants to go to um, university and become a scientist. And so it's following a lot of his life and the drama that happens within his family. But really, for me, all of that was backdrop because the actual story is about a very slow alien invasion. So not the typical alien invasion where, you know, you have some sort of um, almost human-like being coming on spaceships, but instead this is an invasion of plants. And so a bunch of seeds when he's a young teenager um, are, they come through and are deposited in the earth. And there's tons of different types of seeds, so many different ones covering all of the earth. And over the course of his life, these seeds grow into different plants and these plants are extremely different from the sort of uh, flora that we have on earth. And they are often very um, strong and vibrant and big and powerful and also very invasive. These plants are very invasive and they will suck up all of the resources that are in the area where they are to the extent that the humans who live there are pushed out. So it's this kind of long-term slow development of kind of the fall of humanity mm -hmm. through being displaced. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that kind of slow, gradual collapse of humanity while the humans are just living their daily lives and having their own, you know, relationship issues and, and things like that, that was really gripping for me. I was just so engaged as I read through this. I couldn't tear my eyes from my screen just as I was scrolling and reading this on, on the link online. And I just was thoroughly gripped. I love the way that it was written. I was completely drawn in and this dread as you know, you know that the world is falling apart and nobody really fully grasps it. So even though the main character becomes a scientist and studies a lot of what's going on, people in the world are just not reacting. And because it's such a slow change, mm -hmm. they just don't understand the degree to which they are being displaced. 
So for me, that was like this really slow, gradual build. And I liked those themes. And I liked the sort of um, parallels that you could draw between that and things like global warming or gentrification, where people are being displaced. But it's not one big, um, awful event or action. It's just that slow build and detriment of your well-being. Um, and uh, so, as she mentioned, I have a kind of like an opposite um, feel, impression of the story. Uh, but I will mention that uh, what Shannon has just described is what I was hoping the story would be. And for me, that unfortunately was fading into the backdrop. And instead, it seemed the story seemed to be focusing on the humans and ignoring the, what do you say, the slow invasion going on in the backdrop. And that, and so since that was the impression that I had on it, I didn't enjoy it as much. Uh, and I think this might also be due to my personal background in having seen a lot of Indian soaps, which are all about sagas and the human condition and kind of like this, no, 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 pay attention to this person and how bad they're feeling kind of a aspect. And I think maybe that got amped up for me a lot. And so there's this really interesting backdrop going on and I kept wishing it would focus on that backdrop and for me, found it focusing on the humans instead. Mm -hmm. And there is some interesting things going on about the humans, but I was never really uh, interested in them and it, it seemed almost like a distraction for me. And so that's why it didn't really work. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to, you know, focus in on the bits that Shannon mm -hmm. mentioned actually. Yeah, so it's very interesting just how differently we read this story. When we discussed it afterwards, I think we were both so amused to find that this one was basically my favorite and definitely Sush's least favorite. Mm -hmm. And the sort of very reasons that it drew me in mm -hmm. were things that he felt weren't done mm -hmm. it, um, as well. So it's really curious just to see that kind of polarizing effect of this story on us. Yep. Okay, so that wraps up our thoughts on the 2019 Hugo Novelette category finalists. Um, we are very interested to see what the novella and novel categories bring as well. So we're going to be trying to read all of those in the next two months and hopefully make some discussion videos about this as well. Uh, if you guys have read any of these novelettes, um, please let us know in the comments what you thought, um, if your views lined up with ours or were totally different, um, or if you make a video where you're talking about these, we'd be very interested to watch that, so let us know about it as well.